Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's the kind of enthusiasm I enjoy. Uh, certainly, the bulletin looks like a book this morning, so kind of try to juggle all of your papers together. You'll hear more about all these inserts in a few minutes. I welcome all of you to worship service this morning, especially those visiting with us. It's a very special welcome to you. We have a unique problem this morning. We, we ran out of bulletins, so if you'd like to share with your neighbor, we would appreciate that. I call your attention to all of the announcements in the bulletin. You, again, hear more about some of the inserts, but I remind you of our Wednesday night programs. They're going real well. I've often said Wednesday night programs have everything to do with the food and not the program. So I thank Alice Rogers and all of her crew for making that happen. I think we fed 144 or so this past week. Um, the high so far is 155, I believe. That's just wonderful. So come be a part of that time together, that fellowship time, and, and also to hear um, our good friend Allison Ashmore from, from Kent. Also, if you're interested in hearing more information about a possible Presbyterian heritage trip to Scotland, there's a legal pad in the hallway. You can sign up. If you've already called in to sign up, you don't have to do so again. We're just trying to see if we have interest for that trip. Jim and I have been numerous times to, to Scotland and Ireland, as well as the Holy Land and Greece and Turkey, and we're used to traveling, and hopefully we can take 25 or 30 of, of, of you over there to, to really experience our Presbyterian heritage on the ground of Scotland. I believe that may be all of the announcements or concerns or celebrations. We'll get to those in a minute. But now we have several minutes for stewardship. Mr. Mike Thomas. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. One of the main goals of the stewardship season is to motivate each giver to grow spiritually by contributing an increased percentage of his or her income as a commitment to Jesus Christ. We hope today to give you some food for thought by taking a brief glance into the giving habits and giving levels of our church family. I've been a member of this congregation all my life. My brother's sister and I were fortunate to be born into a family where stewardship was taught to us by our parents as part of our religious upbringing. What was probably more impressive was to watch our parents practice what they preach. Their pledging and giving to the church and supporting community efforts, both financially and with active participation, are vivid memories for all of us. I believe that pledging or giving to the church is an acknowledgement of my belief in Jesus Christ and the belief that the church, as the body of Christ, has tremendous potential to change, enrich, and improve people's lives. Financial giving enables the church to do what God calls it to do, to help people and to serve Christ. Financial giving is part of the worship process and it helps us grow spiritually. God has blessed us all. And considering the world as a whole, I think it's safe to say that he has blessed us abundantly. The question then becomes, how is God calling me to respond? As I mentioned earlier, we'll take a look at the giving levels of our congregation. In your bulletin, you should have a sheet like this stair step weekly giving chart. Uh, I'm going to give you some numbers uh, about our congregation. And you can fill those in if you would like to just grab a pen or pencil. Please note the K in there. We're asking each of you to strongly consider this uh, stewardship season to step up your giving one step along that chart when you turn in your pledge on Consecration Sunday, two weeks from now. Also in your bulletin is another insert 
This is the one that has the percentages across the top. Down that left hand side, you can look at that and um, get an estimate of what your um, weekly income is. And once you've found that, move across to the number that corresponds with what you're giving on a week to week basis. Once you make that move, then go up and it shows you the percentage of your income that you're, you're giving the church. It's easy to see if you move one step to the left, what the increase of 1% would do as far as how it affects you, but the combined effect of everyone doing that make us, makes a tremendous difference to our church. That increase is fairly minimal, probably no more than a lunch at Danvers or Connie's or a haircut. Two weeks from today, we will have our celebration luncheon, which will be a catered meal in the Family Life Center. The reservation card, green card, uh, is in your bulletin. And we would like for you to fill that out at this time. This is your reservation for the luncheon after the worship service two weeks from now. Once you fill that out, if you wouldn't mind passing it to the center aisle, I'm going to have the, the ushers pick those up. Our goal is to have every member attend, so if we don't get a reservation card from you, you'll probably be contacted within the next week. At the service prior to the luncheon is when we will complete our commitment forms for the year 2018. So please give this prayerful consideration before that day. Thank you.
Please stand for the call to worship. In deep gratitude, we come to worship God. We recognize God as the source of all goodness. All good gifts come from the Spirit of God. Love and Come with grateful hearts, not for things, but for who God is. We gather to show our gratitude in a song. This time I invite the young people to please come forward for the children's moment.
When we have a baby that is baptized in our church, when the baby is baptized in front of all of us, all of the adults and all of the children, because we all have to make a promise when a baby is baptized. It's more than just about the baby and God. It also is all of us making a promise to help teach that baby all about Jesus and all about God. And so you may think, I don't know if I'm ever going to be that baby Sunday school teacher. I'm not sure that I can do this. But there are lots of ways that we can help each other learn about God. What does anybody have a way that we can help teach each other about God? What can we do? We can read the Bible together. What else? Yeah, we can, we can do projects together. What else? What else? We can pray together. That's right. What about if we just show each other kindness? Or we can be helped. We can be helpful to one another. We can be helpful and share. All of those things are what God wants us to do. You can trade about the trade things that you have and share. That's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. Is when we have something that we don't need or that somebody else needs, we can share it with each other. So we're going to stay up here right now. And this is going to be a lot. But what I want you to do, I want you to be able to see baby Emma when she gets back up. So I want us to see if we can all move all over here so we can see. Can we get up and move? Okay, we can all sit on the floor on the front pew so we can all see. You want to come sit right here? Perfect. Now we all are going to be able to see. Are you ready? <laughs> Sounds like it. It's okay. Are you ready? Let's listen carefully to these words concerning baptism. The Bible teaches all of us that the sign of salvation is to be applied to children of believing parents. In the Old Testament, circumcision was that sign. In the New Testament, baptism is the sign. The baptism of our children symbolizes the reality that they are indeed set apart in the sight of God. Baptism is the first step toward full membership in the Church of Jesus Christ. It is a sign that God loves Emma long before Emma can love God. Baptism assures, baptism assures our children and especially, especially their parents that the benefits of the new covenant belong to all the family and not just to the adult members. It's also a symbolic offering of the child's life to the Lord when the parents is, when the parents are too young, when the child is too young to do so for himself or herself. The sacrament of baptism is indeed a precious privilege, as well as a very high duty, which belongs to every member of the Presbyterian Church into whose home the Lord has sent children. Jack and Kathy have some questions for you. In presenting your child this morning for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ, and you show that you want your child to study him, to know him, and serve him as a chosen disciple. Show your purpose now by answering these questions. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, do you? Do you trust in him? Do you trust in him, do you? Do you intend for your children to be his disciples to obey his word and to show his love, do you? And now do you promise in humble reliance upon God's grace to set before Emma an example of new life in Christ, do you? On behalf of the station, I present Emma and Catherine Nunley for baptism. To you, the members of this congregation, Christian nurture of this, this child so that in due time she may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Do you? We do. Will you endeavor by your example and fellowship to strengthen her family ties to the household of God? Will you? We will. May we pray together.
Ever-loving God, in your mercy, promise to be not only our God, but also the God of our children. We thank you this day for receiving Emma by baptism. Keep her always in your love and guide her as, he grow, as she grows in faith. And protect her from the dangers and temptations of life. Gracious give God, giver of all of life, we pray now especially for Jack and Kathy. Give them wisdom and patience to guide their children in the way of Jesus Christ and the faith of the church. Let your peace and joy dwell in their home and their family life be instructed by faith, sustained by prayer, and governed by love. Strengthen them in their own baptism that they, that they may serve you faithfully in the name of Jesus Christ, our one Lord and Savior. Amen. Emma, Catherine Nunley, child of God, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is my privilege and honor to welcome our newest member. This is our newest member in the Church of Jesus Christ. Isn't this great? Emma is a child of God, just like you, a child of God. And she has received a very special mark on her forehead this morning. And that mark means that she will be God's forever and ever and ever. Nothing can wash that mark away. It will be there until she returns to God. And you have promised, even though Jack and Kathy live in Oxford, not Starkville, <laughs> you have promised to help raise this child in the Christian church. And you can do that even though they live about an hour away. You can pray for Emma. When you see Emma, you can, or see her parents, you can check and see how she's doing in her Christian journey. And I pray that you will do a good job. And now representing the congregation, could you please return Emma to her parents? something new in your bulletin as we celebrate baptism. It's an, it's an affirmation of faith, congregational response from the French Reformed Church, part of our tradition as Presbyterians. May we say what we believe using this congregational response. Do I need to take her back? <laughs> Emma, for you Jesus Christ came into the world. For you he went through the agony of Gethsemane darkness of Calvary, for you he triumphed over death, for you little child, even though you do not know it, but this is what we believe, we love God because he first loved us, welcome to the family of faith, amen, you may be seated.
scripture passage, first of all, this morning comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Ezekiel, the, the wonderful prophet, chapter 22, verse 23 through 31. In this passage, as in most of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is extremely upset with God's people, Israel. In my Bible, it says that this passage entitles this passage, The Classes of Sinners beginning with verse 23. May we listen very carefully for God's word to all of us. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indign indign indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in, in her midst, like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured lives, they have taken treasure and precious things, and they have made many widows in the midst of her. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the profane, and they have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they hide their eyes from from my Sabbaths, and I have, and I am profaned among them. Her princesses within her are like wolves, tearing, tearing the prey by shedding blood and destroying lives in order, in order to get dis, dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced oppression and committed robbery, and they have wronged the poor and needy and oppressed. And I searched for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Thus I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with fire of my wrath, the fire of my wrath. Their way I have brought upon their heads, declares the Lord God. And now turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also this is indeed the word of god may we pray gracious god we pause now to hear your word Silence in us any voice but your own, so we will hear and faithfully respond. Amen. <coughs> Today is the second Sunday in October. The weather is supposed to be what? Cooler. The leaves should be changing colors soon. Football season for some of us, thank the good Lord, is halfway over. <laughs> and in just about three or four weeks, I guess it's just about a month away, we will roll the clocks back, right? And it is stewardship season. Aren't you thrilled? <laughs> and sure as God made little green apples, we're going to talk about money here in the church house. And oddly enough, I look forward to this time of the year, to the revelation of how you and I will open ourselves up to God's service. But I realize that this season doesn't always excite everyone. It's the time of the year when the pastor's own son doesn't really care what daddy's preaching on. I was talking to our son yesterday. We were talking about football. It was a good day for us. It was a gamecock. We're talking about his new house, and then he asked me what I was preaching on today. I said money, and he hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> it 
It's the time of the year when members turn to visitors and apologize saying, please come back in a few weeks. Please come back in a few weeks. He'll be off of the topic then, and after all, he's just our interim minister anyway, but come back in a few weeks. It's also the time of the year when the PBPL goes into effect. The PBPL. What's that? The Pocketbook Protection League, right? <laughs> you know what? This makes the 30th time. The 30th time I have struck up the band for the annual stewardship shuffle. And I sometimes wonder if anyone cares. Do the phrases from the pulpit make any mark, produce any fruit at all, or in the case of today's topic, dent any wallets. In a church bulletin, these words appeared. The Lord loves a cheerful giver, but he also accepts from a grouch. <laughs> all week long, I have turned over in my head what to say and how to say it. And all week long, all week long, a little voice echoed in my mind and asked, does it matter? doesn't matter. You know, it can prove a very frustrating thing to preach the gospel, but I know from experience, as you do, it's a far more difficult thing, task, to live the gospel. You need to understand something this morning. I am wrestling with the same questions that trouble you. Even as I speak, I'm trying to decide what our family will give to the Church of Jesus Christ this year. And yes, preachers do tithe. How much should I give to the church? It's a struggle. But it really shouldn't be a struggle. You know, each week we face a different endeavor together. Last week we talked about my friend Thomas and his exclusion from the Church of Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago, we chatted about what our calling should be as Christians in our culture today. And today's battlefield happens to involve our Christian use of money. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell. Did you know that? Eleven of the 39 parables that Jesus told deal with money. Eleven out of 39. One out of seven verses, one out of every seven verses in the Gospel of Luke deals with finances. And I guess what I'm trying to say this morning is that preachers and pewsters are not adversaries. I'm not, not up here trying to take something away from you. I stand in an attempt to lead all of us toward a better understanding of how we might serve God. So let's look at this money thing together. Society as a whole doesn't look too good, does it? Political leaders routinely betray trust, neglect responsibility, and abuse influence. Well-known religious leaders fall in disgrace, the victims of greed and a lust for power. Families bypass holy days and virtually ignore worship. Not enough people care about the homeless, abandon the children, cry out from homes, and no one seems to care or hear. And the possibility of internal and international violence leans ever more toward a possibility. Now, I forgot to mention that we're momentarily back in the year 590 B.C. or thereabouts. And the preacher for the week, they called them prophets way back then, Ezekiel. And I doubt that Ezekiel would have made it today. He worked alone. He hated committees. Didn't care who did what when or who your daddy was. He just sort of slapped people around with the back of his hand. And Ezekiel likens Israel to a decaying, crumbling city. And here, here we pick up the sermon. 
Thus says the Lord, I have looked for someone to build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the sake of the nation, so that I would not destroy it. But I have found no one. No one. Even though he lived a long time ago, when we hear Ezekiel moan about his society, we know what he's feeling, don't we? We so badly need someone to stand in the gap. You know, in so many ways, our world does make progress. I remember vividly as a child, huddling beneath my desk at Conway Elementary School during civil defense drills, harboring and uninformed youthful confidence that as long as I stayed under that desk, that little wooden desk, the Reds couldn't get me even with, with their best A-bomb. Well, you know what? The bear doesn't growl as much as it used to. And that's a good thing. But as soon as this curtain over here falls, signaling the easing of Soviet-American tensions, Another marquee over there announces the next coming attraction, disaster, murder in Las Vegas. Perhaps disaster in the Middle East or confrontation on the Korean Peninsula. Consider our nation, how we stand in amazement at the lunacy of our political leaders with the inability of intelligent men and women, both sides of the aisle, to grasp the most basic of all economic laws. Thou shalt not spend more money than thou hast. And here at the old church house, we use a rather antiquated system, right? If the column marked expenses exceeds the figures labeled income, we will do what? Well, we will worship without bulletins, Maybe even worship in the dark. We will reluctantly say goodbye to some of our staff, and we will certainly cut benevolent giving, or all of the above. Consider the church of Jesus Christ on the brink of what may well prove an era of growth and outreach unlike anything we've ever experienced. Occasionally, to me, seems a little unsure just a bit tentative, a little prudent. We have to do something. We absolutely have to solve our community, national, and worldwide problems. And I believe without question, and I refuse to vacate the notion, the position, that the best possibility for solution, perhaps the, the only possibility, will come to the world and nation and community through this organization known as the bruised and battered body of Jesus Christ, the church. If the world in which we live in intends to survive, the church must not just exist. The church must flourish. And the church will only flourish if you and I stand in the gap. And standing in the gap calls for several things. It calls, first of all, for commitment. Commitment. So I ask you this morning, what does the church mean to you? What does the church mean? Is it just something pleasant? Is it a nice diversion when, when nothing else beckons? Is it a place to bring our children to teach them how to behave? What does the church mean to you? General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was asked the secret of his amazing commitment to Jesus Christ. And Booth answered, I told the Lord that he could have all that there is of William Booth. I wonder if we have given our all to Christ and his church. Standing in the gap also requires conviction, commitment, and then conviction. I used to be a boxing fan years ago. I just loved it. Don't really care much about it these days. It's just different. 
One of my favorites was Evander Holyfield. On October 25th, 1990, he became the heavyweight champion of the world. And during his post-fight interview, he gave a brief overview of the fight. And then, without flash or arrogance, he said these words. He said, all things come from above. Evander was a boxer, not a theologian, not a philosopher, but his simple statement of faith makes all the profound statements of, of the alleged deep thinkers pale by comparison. All things come from above. Now, if pressed, you and I would say the same thing, right? All things come from above. After all, it sounds good. Sounds Christian. But right now, in this season of Christian stewardship, you and I have the chance to prove we really believe that all things come from above. If all things come from above, then all things belong to God. If all things belong to God, do we have the right to withhold anything from God? Take a very close look at your weekly gift. I never know what the congregation gives to the church. I know what I give. But take a close look at your weekly gift. How does it relate to the other gifts that you make to your alma mater, to your loved ones at Christmas, to the symphony, to the art museum, to the community theater, to yourself in the form of golf clubs? I need some new ones. Trips, choice seats at sporting events. That special party you want to have to show off the house or, or to show off your daughter or to show off the new wallpaper. I know we don't mean to, but most of us will give more consideration to picking out our next suit than we will to our financial gift to the Church of Jesus Christ. You know, the time has come to make a serious endorsement to Christ to put our money where our faith is and thereby take a place standing in the gap. And standing in the gap offers no options. You know, it can become a frightening thing to determine how much I really love the Lord. But in all truth, that during the stewardship season, we show our affection for God in a very, very measurable fashion. That is neither overstated nor unfair. It happened one time after a pastor had made an appeal for money that a certain woman came up to him and handed him her pledge card. And it had $500 written on it, $500 a year. And she asked the pastor, she asked, is this satisfactory? And the pastor immediately replied, well, if it represents you and your appreciation for the gift of Jesus Christ. And there was a moment of soul-searching thought, and she asked to have the pledge card returned to her. She left with it. She returned a few days later. She scratched out the $500. She wrote $750 a year on her card. And she once again asked that question, is my gift satisfactory? And the pastor gave the same answer as before. If it represents you and your appreciation for the gift of Jesus Christ. And as before, a, a truth seemed to be driving home deeply. And after a few moments of hesitation, she took the card back and went home. Later in the week, she came again with her card and she gave it to the pastor. She placed it in the pastor's hand. And she said this. She said, after earnest prayer, after thoughtful, prayerful consideration, I have come to the conclusion that this pledge does represent me and my appreciation for the gift of Jesus Christ, and I am happy to give it. If the gospel means anything, if Christ's loving forgiveness touches us at all, we must understand the master's control over our life includes our financial commitment. You know, I believe strongly that the time is gone when we say things like this. Well, just put me down for whatever I gave last year. 
The day is gone when we could just get by with tossing Jesus a buck or two as if he just fetched, fetched our car for us. The day is gone when we can refuse to give anything at all. So you and I must open the good book, pour over the pages, read and study and analyze until we come across some answers, answers for ourselves, our children, our family, our enemies, and indeed our world. The solutions will take time. It will require some effort and cost money. Jesus Christ demands our gift. Where your treasure is, there also is your heart. If we intend the church to stand in the gap, to fill the void where the walls of this beleaguered world have fallen, we have to pay the price. That is our commitment and conviction based on the demands of the master. You know what? By showing up this morning, you and I made a statement that only one faith has the power necessary for today. One faith only. A faith radical enough to to take on the basic problems of the world. A faith strong enough to endure the ridicule and rejection which society dishes out daily. And a faith prepared to stand in that gap. Are you ready to take your place? Thanks be to God. Our hymn of dedication is hymn number 359.
Then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I have to give some credit for this sermon I preached to a dear friend of mine, Art Fogarty, who was my a summer intern supervisor some 33 years ago. Reverend Fogarty probably taught me more about preaching, believe it or not. I'm sure you probably say, no, he didn't teach you anything about it, than any professor I ever had in seminary. He taught me about timing. He taught me about topics. He said, never worry about preaching about finances in church because that's who Jesus was and that's what we need to do. So I give him a great deal of credit for this sermon this morning. Not many prayer concerns this morning. That's a good thing for this church. Maybe some that I'm just not aware of. Julie Siler's home after her brief stay in the hospital. Please remember her in your prayers. Also, those who are grieving and still terribly confused about the Las Vegas shooting. Also, those who are experiencing heartache because of now three hurricanes that have hit our country this past, past few weeks, past month. Any prayer concerns? I not aware of any. Perhaps you have some. Also, please note today uh, we will begin something I think used to be a tradition here years ago. We'll have a, a choral amen. So after the benediction, just don't rush out. Just hang around for maybe 30 seconds and listen to the choral amen, please. May we come to God in prayer. Gracious God, maker of heaven and earth, we lift up to you our hearts and minds and prayers and offer our thanks for your Son, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. We pray this morning for you to deliver us from everything that prevents us from experiencing your grace, hearing your call, and singing your song. Free us from feelings of bitterness toward those who have hurt us. Free us from or free us for forgiveness and reconciliation. Free us from the burdens of the past and, and the fears of the future that keep us from, from knowing what it means to be fully alive right now. Keep us connected to you. And help us to be agents of your healing law for those whose relationships are disintegrating and whose lives are in disarray. Keep us from inconsiderate acts, harmful words, and premature judgments. And never let us forget the ones whom the world has forgotten, the powerless, the poor, the lonely, the lost, the dying, and the disenfranchised, the anxious, and the abused. O oh God, be the source of strength and hope and comfort to all who, who call upon you in faith. We pray that you will turn our tragedies into comedies, Gift us with silence amid the noise, hope amid the heartache, assurance amid the insecurity, and peace amid the panic, and laughter amid the tears. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our one Lord and Savior, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we bring our gifts to God, let us listen to these words. We confess our faith by what we say. We confess our faith by what we do, where we go, what we think. And we also profess our faith with what we give. May we bring our gifts to God.
May we pray together. Gracious God, you call us to let go of the things we cling to and step out in faith, trusting in your love and provision. Give us courage to step out boldly, to plant our small seeds generously and without fear. Use our gifts to accomplish more than we could possibly imagine, so that through us, your kingdom might come. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 538. carefully to the good news. God goes ahead of you to be your guide. God is beside you to be your friend. God is behind you to encourage you. God is above and below you to sustain you. So whoever you are and wherever you go in God's good creation and whatever happens of good or of ill, remember that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen.